again, to remind you, my name is Svetlana. The talk is about predictability in the stock market. During the first half of the talk, we were, talk we were discussing time series predictability. We are knowing the information about some of the factors today. I try to forecast what is going to be the return tomorrow. And I showed you by nature of various statistical, let's say, features of those predictors is that quite often it is possible to find out predictability when in fact there is none. And once you take properly into account the persistence of the regressors, the multiple testing, selection bias, inherent non-linearity and structural breaks in the relationship between various variables, a lot of what initially seemed like a robust statistical relationship actually disappears. And we also started talking about the other dimension of predictability, which is cross-sectional one. When instead of predicting the return in time series for a particular security, instead I'm trying to predict that the return on this security is going to be higher than the return on that one. And so I can benefit from making this bet, from buying the one that is going to probably have a higher return and selling the one that is going to probably have a lower return, again, trying to get additional profits, okay? So that is the cross-sectional predictability. And this part of the talk is gonna be precisely how we can think about this cross-sectional predictability in the stock market, how can we measure it, and whether, again, it's gonna be a violation of efficient market hypothesis, whether it presents something like a free lunch on the market, or whether it's actually coming with a certain price. In fact, what I will try to convince you during this talk is that a lot of those patterns which are available in the data relating to the size, the value of the companies and momentum, these are not free lunch. These are not arbitrage strategies that allow you to make money out of nothing. But they actually have a very price, very simple, simply defined price, the price of risk. Okay, so before we actually go to any sort of model, again, I wanted to provide some sort of a kind of framework of how people in finance, at least empirical asset pricing, try to think about what is the right model for evaluating the price and cost of different asset classes. And this is going to be related to the so-called stochastic discount factor. What is this? The definition is the following. A stochastic discount factor is a stochastic process, basically think of it as just some sort of a time series, such that for any security with a certain payoff in the future, in the period t plus one, which is equal to x, so it could be different in different states of the world, the price of that security today is going to be equal to this quantity, okay? So this is going to be the expected value of the product of the stochastic discount factor and the actual payoff that security is gonna have, for example, one year from now. If I define the return on the security as basically capital gain, so the price one year from now minus the price today divided by the price today, then I can rewrite the same expression in the following way, okay? Notice that by the feature of this stochastic discount factor, if I have something that is really able to price all the assets in the economy, okay? So for every single security which is available out there, the same relationship should hold. That means that it should also hold for the risk-free rate. So the, what is the feature of the risk-free rate? What is the feature of the bond? The way to think about the bond is to imagine that there is a security that is going to pay me $1 in every single state in the world one year from now, okay? So for such a bond, the payoff xt plus one is going to be always equal to just one. The price of these securities today is going to be one divided by one plus r. That is the definition of the risk free rate, okay? So this equation should also hold. What does that mean? That means that once you substitute it back, you can also show the following relationship. So the same stochastic discount factor should also be able to price excess return on the securities, okay? Why this excess return on the securities is important? Because when we think about stocks and many other asset classes, there are basically going to be two components. There is the part which is common across all different securities, and that is the level of the risk-free rate. 
which, for example, could be related to the inflation rate in the economy and, in general, sort of price of money and the natural rate of return in which things becoming more expensive over time. At the same time, stocks are going to have a component which is specific to stocks only. After all, on average, stocks offer a rate of return much higher than that of bond. They have a very different dynamic. They have different factor structure. They have different risks associated with different asset classes. So when I focus on the excess return on the stock, I'm trying to capture and explain precisely this. I'm trying to look at the part of the stock market return, which is something on top of a simple risk-free rate, like an interest rate that you would get on a typical deposit account in the bank. Okay? Okay. How can we construct the stochastic discount factor? What is it? How should we think about it? I will give you one simple example. Okay? Let us consider a very simple world. It's going to be a one-period economy. So there's just today and one year from now. And one year from now, there are going to be as capital possible states of the world. Okay? Think of it as, I don't know, throw in a coin or think of it as calendar date or whether what's going to be the temperature on that particular date, just different states of the world. Each can happen with a certain probability that I'm going to denote by S. Now, I'm going to assume that the market which is operating in this economy is complete. What does it mean complete? That means that there exists a set of the so-called Aero de Bru securities. These are special securities, financial instruments, that are going to have very specific property. They promise to pay you one dollar in one particular state of the world, as small. So, for example, if there is going to be ten different states of the world, I'm going to have ten Aero de Bru securities that are going to be paying each one dollar in their corresponding state and zero in all the others. From the linear algebra perspective, the way to think about these aero debris securities is something like a basis in the vector space. Imagine that you have a space of vectors that have certain dimension. Okay? You can decompose different vectors onto the basis. Okay? Just a simple kind of orthonormal orthogonal basis. That is exactly what this aero debris security do. They basically form a basis for the payoffs of securities across different states. And the basis has such a feature that it's going to be doing one in one direction, in one state, and zero in all the others. The market is going to be complete if I have such a security for every single one of those states. For example, um, I have a, there are three states of the world. Okay? Um, I have a security that pays $2 in the first state, $3 in the third state, and $4 in the fourth state. Like like no, this is not going to be risk-free because depending on the state of the world, the payoff is not constant. Yeah. If it was risk-free, it would be constant in all the states. Yeah. This is like stock or derivative yeah. or whatever you have in mind. But, uh, like the amount that it's going to pay, it's just like what you expect it's going to pay or is no. it like... I'm just saying that there is a security that states that if it's going to rain tomorrow, I'm going to pay you this amount of money. Okay, so it's, if it's not going to rain. I'm going to pay you this amount of okay, money. Yeah. Now, the basis in this space is going to be two securities. Yeah. Security number one, that is going to pay $1 only if it rains. And security number two is going to pay $1 if it does not rain. Yeah. So the first one that pays like three or four, I can think of it as a combination of those two securities. Yeah. Three units of security number one and four units okay, of security okay. so number two. So it's basically a linear combination. Precisely. Yeah. That's exactly the same as a linear combination and vectors. Yeah. Okay. So under the law of one price, which already I actually started to explain by this example, every type of payoff for different security contingent on particular states in the world that I can define in this economy, I can decompose it as being the same as the portfolio of the aerodebris securities. Going back to the example, let's say I'm going to have a contract with Ali that if it's going to rain tomorrow, I'm going to pay him $2. If it's not going to rain tomorrow, which is probably the case, he's going to pay me $1. Okay? So this is going to be just a security. How can I think of it as the portfolio of the aero securities? Well, let us define a security that 
if it does not rain, I pay you one dollar. And if it rains, he pays me one dollar as well. Then my initial contract with Ali was basically a combination of two securities of type one and one security of type two. Okay? So again, simple linear decomposition. What the law of one price tells you is that if I have two portfolios of different securities that at some point in the future have exactly the same payoff in every single state of the world, then today these two portfolios should also have exactly the same price. It's a simple <coughs> non-arbitrage argument. I'm not talking about expectations here. I'm talking about exact realizations for every single state in the world in the future. If I'm able to find these two instruments which are exactly identical in terms of their payoff, that means that today the price should be exactly the same. Okay? So, how can I? Yes? So, like, uh, the vectors you have should have the predictable feature. So, is it the case uh, like for each member of the basis, if you know what happens now or, or in the history, you can also say, okay, in the future uh, it will pay me this amount of money. I have these securities that I am able to verify which state can happen okay. only one year from now. So now in period zero, I don't know whether it's going to rain or not rain. Yeah. But I know that if it rains, security one gives me yeah. one dollar. And if it doesn't rain, security two gives me one dollar. So there is uncertainty about which one is actually going to happen. Yeah. But I still know I okay. that the portfolio of those guys is equivalent to my contract with Ali. So how can I think about that contract that I have just entered with Ali? Okay? I know that the price of this bet, this security that has different payoffs in different states of the world, should be the same as the price of the portfolio that consists of specific numbers of securities, paying one dollar in particular states, so that the actual payoffs of this complex security or the portfolio of Aero Debru securities is exactly the same. Okay? So I can decompose it as basically a weighted combination. And there is, like say, where X, S is going to be the number of Aero Debru security that pays one dollar in the state S needed to replicate a particular payoff in that state. And QS is going to be the price of the corresponding Aero Debru security, right? So I'm going to just multiply and divide it by those probabilities of each of those states. I'm not saying anything about expected values here. I'm just multiplying and dividing. Okay, so far it's just the low fund price. And I'm going to introduce a new quantity, which is going to be this MS, precisely the ratio between the price of the Aero degree of security and the probability with which the state is going to happen. Therefore, I can represent the price of my asset as the weighted combination of pi S multiplied by this new variable MS multiplied by XS. But look at this quantity from kind of simple theory of probability perspective, okay? This is basically nothing more than the expected value of the random variable. Expected value with the random variable that takes the values ms multiplied by xs in different states of the world, and each of those states is coming with a weight which is equal to exactly the probability with which is going to happen, okay? So therefore, this is nothing more than just the expected value of that m multiplied by x. So this M that I have introduced as the ratio, these prices of Aero Debru securities and the physical probabilities with which particular states are going to happen is the stochastic discount factor. Whatever is going to be the actual combination of payoffs in different states in this very simple economy, every single price of that security is going to be following this equation. Okay? And again, the only thing that I needed to derive it here was just completeness of the market, um, one period economy, discrete number of states, I'm just listing all of the assumptions, but most importantly, the law of one price. I'm not assuming that prices behave according to some data generating process. I'm just saying that if the markets are complete and there are no arbitrage, then this needs to hold. It's a simple consequence of the definition. The same as the relationship that Campbell-Schiller decomposition we saw before. It doesn't depend on the assumption of the model. Well, I mean, it does on the absence of arbitrage and things like that, but it does not depend on what you believe should be the fair price or not fair price. It just leads the relationship, the fair relationship between different variables. Well, this example is very simple, and obviously 
it looks like a stretch, and sort of like a very easy, elegant, but at the same time kind of useless solution to think about different concepts. It turns out that it can be fairly easily generalized into very different settings. So you can think of continuum of different events. For example, imagine the real life company. And imagine the security that is going to be paying the dividend of that company, like a stock. Exanta today, I have no idea what is going to be the dividend one year from now, right? For if I take Apple, Apple may decide not to pay dividends. After all, this is what they have been doing for the last several years. Or they can decide to suddenly pay dividend five dollars. They could decide to pay dividend seven dollars, depending on whatever is going with the company one year from now. I don't know all those events. And there could be infinitely many states under which they're going to make this decision to assign a particular number to the dividend they want to pay. So there are infinitely many states, infinitely many possibilities. Okay? This is going to be change number one. The markets non do not necessarily have to be complete. What does that mean? That means that not always I'm going to be able to find different securities that can pay in a particular state of the world and not all the others. Let me give you an example. There does not exist a market for security whether I'm going to finish the stock on time or not. It could still be a bet, and you could still imagine some people sort of making that bet, whether I'm going to be late or whether I'm going to finish on time, but it does not exist yet. Securities on some medical outcomes, again, they do not exist. The point is that for different states of the world, quite often there is no way to differentiate them. It also relates to various options and derivatives. There are going to be contracts for some states of the world, for some of the conditions, but not for all of them. And this is what is going to be defining the market incompleteness. There is a fundamental theorem of asset pricing that has been proved quite a while ago and has been used extensively in many different applications, which states the following. If the markets are complete, and that is the key assumption here, then there exists a unique stochastic discount factor that is going to be able to price every single security in that market. Okay? That does not depend on the type of the security. That doesn't depend on the timing. That does not depend on whether security is one period or multi-period. That does not depend on a particular state of the world and what's the distribution of payments, whether it's a bond or a stock or some other characteristic. The stochastic discount factor is going to be able to price all of them in the same way following that expectation equation. If the markets are incomplete, and again, there are no arbitrage, which is the key assumption here, then again, there will exist a stochastic discount factor that will be able to, again, price all those securities. The key difference, however, is that this SDF is going to be no longer unique. And again, intuitively, the way to think about it is the rank of the space of the vectors. Okay? So imagine if I have only two vectors, which are going to be three-dimensional. Then this space is not going to be kind of complete. It doesn't have full rank, right? There could be infinitely many, I don't know, combinations or bases that I could be using them. That corresponds to the incomplete market. But does there exist a basis that I can represent those two vectors as linear combination of that basis? Of course. Of course it does. That's exactly the same thing with the SDF. And the only thing that I need in order to, for this theorem to hold, really, is the law of one price. That if I have two securities which promise exactly the same payoff in a particular state of the world in the future, in all of those states, that means that today those two securities should have the same price. Okay? Law of one price, no arbitrage. If you believe this is a fair description of the market, that means there is going to exist at least one stochastic discount factor, such a time series, that all the prices of all securities which are traded in the market, stocks, bonds, options, everything that you might come up with, they're all going to be expressed through that equation. Another way to rewrite the stochastic discount factor is to use the so-called beta representation. Okay? So let's start with the um, fundamental equation that is going to be defined for these um, excess returns. Okay? So let's say stock returns minus the bond returns. You can easily rewrite them through covariances, right? Because think of it, the expectation of the product is going to be related to the covariance and the product of the expectations. So I can rewrite this in order to express the expected return on the security as being basically the ratio of two things. One is going to be the covariance between that security return 
and the stochastic discount factor and the expected value of that stochastic discount factor. If I manipulate it further, and for example, multiply and divide by the variance of my idea, what I get is the beta representation. And what it tells you is a very important thing. It tells you that the return <coughs> on every single security is going to be determined by how much is going to be loading on the stochastic discount factor. In this economy, <coughs> SDF is basically a source of risk. Okay? So that risk, we don't know what exactly it comes from. Could be related to labor, to unemployment, to consumption, to ECMON, to market returns, to industry-specific factors, to all of them at the same time. But there is a something that exists out there that captures this risk. And the return on every single security, the expected return, is going to be determined precisely on my exposure to that risk. Okay? <clears throat> this is really the key of the modern asset pricing theory. Why? Because it gives you implication for the cross-sectional returns. And it gives you an idea on how to test different models together. Because if I look at the securities and the return of, for example, Apple versus Google, and I see that the return on one stock is systematically higher than the return on the other, then from this equation, what it follows is that the one which is the higher return should have a higher beta with respect to the SDF. So that high return, systematically high return, is nothing more than a reward for risk. And in this case, the risk is going to be captured with precisely the impact of that SDF. A typical way to estimate this cross-sectional sort of predictability and cross-sectional pricing impact is going to be with a generalized method of moments or with formal best regressions. I will talk a little bit about both of them. Well, if we know everything about cross-sectional asset pricing, then why, I mean, why do we still study finance, right? So we sort of explain that everything is going to be determined by the loading on that SDF and the exposure of me with respect to that risk factor. So it seems like everything is done. The problem is we don't know what is this SDF, okay? We don't observe it. We don't know how to extract it directly from the data. We know some properties that it should be able to satisfy, it, but generally we don't observe it. So all of the finance literature, in particular asset pricing, is pretty much trying to determine what is that SDF? What is that pricing kernel which should explain cross-sectional differences between different returns? What should explain why small caps on average are going to have a high rate of return compared to large caps? What should explain that, I know, um, some other stocks, let's say value stocks, have returns higher than the growth stocks? <clears throat> One particular model that was the first in terms of studying this cross-sectional impact is called capital asset pricing model. It's very old. It's over 50 years old. So again, please don't be so skeptical that it looks very linear and simplistic. It's 50 years old, and that's a lot because pretty much this is exactly the age of the finance. So this is like the baby, baby first step. And it's actually not that bad once you think about it. So according to the KPM, there is only one source of risk, the part of that stochastic discount factor, and that is the market return. And the idea is that investors are going to be compensated only for the part of risk which they cannot diversify, in a sense, by combining different stocks together in a big portfolio, so that the news <coughs> about one particular company is are basically going to wash out, and it's not going to influence my kind of return as a whole. The only things that are going to keep influencing me and that well-diversified portfolio, which consists of many different stocks, are going to be market-wide news, okay? Something that is important for all of the stocks at the same time. And the idea behind this KPM equation <coughs> is that the excess return on the stock is going to be directly proportional with as a specific proportion to the market excess return. For example, if um, I have the market excess return that moves today by 5%, and I have a sensitivity with respect to that market equal to 1, bit equal to 1, that means that on average the return on the stock is also going to move by 5% during the same type of fluctuations. Some of the stocks are more sensitive 
to market-wide news. So they're going to have high beta. Some of the stocks are going to be less sensitive to the market fluctuations. So they're going to have low beta. And you can measure this beta through the simple time series regression. Just take a return on energy security, regress it against the market excess return, and the slope in that model is going to be your estimate of beta. In particular, if you try to get the bonds and you try to regress them against the market return, excess return, you're going to get zero, more or less. Okay. <clears throat> Coupling has two dimensions. There is a time series dimension and there is the cross-sectional dimension. In particular, in terms of the cross-sectional dimension, what it tells you is that the only difference why a particular security should have a return higher than the other is because it has a higher beta. And this is something that we can test. So what about the other implication? Kaplan also tells you that once you control for the beta and for the impact of these market-wide fluctuations on my excess returns, there shouldn't be anything left. Okay? So if I try to estimate the intercept on this time series regression, alpha i, it should be equal to zero. Because again, if the only source of risk in the economy are the market-wide fluctuation, that means that once I control for them, there should be no systematic differences between the returns on different security. So another testable implication is that all these alphas here, they should be equal to zero. If you see that stocks with a certain characteristics tend to have alphas, that means that even controlling for the market-wide impact, market-wide shocks, there are still some residual differences between stocks of different characteristics. And that means KPM doesn't work. Okay? All right. So, this was the first model that started to look into cross-sectional aspects of asset pricing. And over the last 50 years, there have been thousands of models that have been proposed for various reasons when I saw that this one actually doesn't seem to be explaining all of the features of the cross-section of the returns. So now we're going to take a look at some of those violations. Okay? The first violation is the one that I already mentioned, which is the value and growth anomaly. Well, again, we're looking at the companies and a particular characteristic of those companies, which is the ratio of their book to market value. The growth stocks, again, I will remind you, these are the companies with a low book to market value. So usually there's a, like new companies that are developing rapidly, they are growing and so on and so forth. The value stocks, the one that Warren Buffett likes so much, these are going to be companies with a high book to market. One of the way to think and to try to capture the effect of this kind of characteristic impact on the expected returns is by forming portfolios of stocks. And initially, it was done in the following way. Every June, I'm going to take all those 3,000 companies which are traded on the stock exchanges. And I'm going to sort all of them based on the value of their book to market. And then I'm going to form the portfolios. These are the bottom 10%. These are the next 10%. These are the next 10%, and so on and so forth. I could form deciles of the returns. For example, let us look at those 10 portfolios. Okay. If KPM is true, that means that the average return on each of that portfolio should be determined fully by its exposure to the market excess return, by its beta. So for each of that portfolio, and I can compute it as just the weighted average of the returns on the stocks that come into that portfolio, I can estimate a simple time series regression of its return on the market excess return. These are going to be my estimates of beta. And I'm going to plot those estimates of betas versus the actual average return that the portfolio generates over the years. If coupling was true, that means that all of them should be lying on the same line. So remember, the return is kind of risk-free rate, and then things which are proportional to betas with the same slope. All these portfolios should be here. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, if you look at the actual distribution of the returns versus beta, it's a mess. One thing, however, becomes clear is that not only KPM does not work, but also that on average, the returns on the portfolios 
they seem to be increasing with a high book to market. So value companies, on average, offer you a higher rate of return compared to the growth companies. Not just on average, but even after I condition on the market-wide fluctuations. Okay? So even conditional on the beta of those companies, I still see that there is a value premium. This was the first kind of very big blow to the capital asset pricing model. The second one came with the size. Okay? So I'm going to form portfolios based on their market capitalization. Again, from small companies to large companies. And again, the basic idea is that if KPM works, then the only difference in returns on those portfolios should be fully explained by the betas of that portfolio with respect to the market. So I'm going to plot the same thing. Within each of those file, their cells, okay? Let's say value, growth, and everything else. I'm going to further sort stocks with respect to the size. And what I see is again a mess. Stocks with different size are going to have different expected returns, even conditional on the fact that they have value growth, and even conditional on the fact that they have certain estimates of beta. Okay? So again, if the model was true, everything would be lining up on the, not 45 degree line, but on the straight line. But as you can see, all the estimates of the actual returns are quite erratic. This is the size anomaly. I could repeat the same experiment. I could start with size, just sorting small companies and big companies. And then within each of those sorting, I could further look at the returns of value and growth portfolios. And again, check whether those align with the KPM within each of those size decile. And again, that's going to be a total mess. The relationship is not really linear. It is not explained by beaters. It, is not, it should be explained by something else. We can also look at the alphas. Remember that idea that, again, if KPM really explains whatever is going on with the average returns of different portfolios, that means that once I control for betas, all the residual differences in returns should be insignificant. All the alphas in the time series regressions should be equal to zero. We can test it. For example, here I'm plotting the alphas that are going to be coming up with different portfolios sorted by size and sorted by their book-to-market ratio. Okay? And as you see, that once I go from small portfolios to big portfolios within each of the deciles, okay, on average, the alpha is going to be decreasing, which again tells you that big companies are going to have the returns smaller than large companies, oh sorry, than small companies, even controlling for the beta, for the market exposure. I could read the table in the opposite direction too. For each of the impact of the size, I'm going to look at the alpha which is associated with the book to market. Okay? And you see that if you look at the book to market, then on average it's going to be decreasing. So if I look at the low book to market companies, they're going to have a um, higher rate of return compared to the high ones. That is the value premium. So this is sort of another way to represent the existence and to test that KPM unfortunately doesn't really work. Why it doesn't work? Because it cannot explain the cross-sectional patterns in returns. Okay? I'm not looking at the time series R square here. I'm not saying whether I can explain 90% of the time series fluctuations through their common movements with the market. The only implication of the stochastic discount factor is on the cross-sectional asset pricing. Whether I can explain the characteristics and the difference in performance of different stocks through the exposure to the risk factor, which in this case market, and I can't. So this is why Fama and French, in a very famous series of papers, they try, start, started to argue that if you really want to capture whatever are going to be the fluctuations and cross-sectional differences in returns, it's not enough to include just the market. You should also control for other important characteristics, in particular size and value. Initially, the way they tried to do it is a, with a simple regression where on top of the market, they also added the log of the market capitalization. And they also added the logarithm of the book-to-market ratio to precisely capture the impact that return could also be somehow related to these characteristics. And it actually seems to work a pretty good job at explaining cross-sectional returns. For example, the graph on the left 
plots you predicted versus the average cross-sectional returns on a bunch of different portfolios if I use just KPM. If your model was correct, then it should be 45 degree line, right? Because the average return should be as close to the predicted for a particular portfolio as close as possible. So if the model was a good one, you would expect portfolios to line up on a 45 degree line, again, actual versus predicted. It doesn't, which again tells you that KPM is really, really bad at explaining cross-sectional differences between the returns of different portfolios. However, if I use a three-factor model, it actually works much better, okay? So on average, you are able to capture both the size and the value and also the impact of just the market-wide fluctuations. So they called it the Pharma French three-factor model. That includes now not just market, but on top of that, it also includes the size and the value, HML and SMB factors. What about momentum? Momentum is another characteristic that I already mentioned before. So if you form the portfolio of momentum, then you would assume that depending on what you consider returns of winners or losers against stocks sorted in particular portfolio based on particular characteristics, if KPM was true, okay, then you would expect all those alphas to be equal to zero because all the returns on whether you're a winner or a loser, especially in the future, should be totally determined by how risky I am with respect to the market. Again, we can test it and we can look at the alphas. And what you see is that those stocks that used to perform badly in the past, they continue to perform badly even after controlling for whatever was going with the market during those times. And the stocks that performed well, these are going to be the winners, they continue to perform well even controlling for, again, the exposure to the market-wide fluctuations. So once again, if KPM was true, all of this should be zero or insignificant. But there is a clear pattern that relates to the prior performance, whether you're a loser, whether you're a winner. In short, these are the four most widespread factors which are now used in applied literature and also not just in academics, obviously, but in um, money management industry as well. You can also invest according to the strategies, the market, size, value, and momentum. These returns that I present in the table, they are net of trading costs. So all these bid ask spreads, the turnover was associated with them, everything is already taken into account. One thing that should be noted, however, is that momentum, although it offers like a really high rate of return, it also is going to be associated with substantial risks involved. Even if you measure just usual standard deviation, or for example, if you look at those crashes that I showed you on the graph in the previous talk, and also momentum has a lot of the turnover. So if you think that there are going to be substantial costs in terms of going long or going short or maintaining large positions, then this is something that you should take into account. So Fama French basically introduced um, a class of multi-factor models. Is it still a part of the SDF? Yes. You can still represent this linear type of regressions um, within the SDF framework with that M and the expectation that I showed you before. It would basically assume that M is a linear function of market return, SMB, and HML. So we're still within the framework of the stochastic discount factor. Is that, that now we understand that on top of the market, there could be other sources of risk, the value and the size. One of the problems with this model is that it obviously doesn't really explain why value and the size should be the source of risk. Why should really investors care about that? Pharma French didn't say anything about it. There are many papers that now try to advocate that what we see as the value and the size could actually be explained through different lens of fundamental risks that investors are facing when dealing with a particular company or when that company makes particular corporate decisions. There are a lot of theories. There are a lot of micro foundations, and it is consistent not with just this cross-sectional asset price and implications, but with all the other microeconomic data that we already have. Nevertheless, this reduced form representation is very useful because quite often, while it doesn't fully explain what exactly is the mechanism of that risk, it pretty much does the job of capturing what should be the required rate of return for a security with a particular level of risk, with a particular exposure. And again, when I'm talking about risk, I don't mean all of the risk, in a sense like standard deviation of the returns or things like that. I mean 
the risk which should be rewarded by returns. And in this type of models, it's going to be directly related to the betas. How much I load on the market risk? How much I load on the size risk? How much I load on the value risk? Okay. So one of the typical data sets with which we're going to test different models is the so-called 25 pharma French portfolios. How are they formed? We're again going to be sorting different stocks based on their size and based on their book to market. Okay? And the intersection of different deciles are going to form a cross-section of 25 portfolios. Okay? So that cross-section of 25 portfolios becomes the standard, basically, pricing lab in order to test whether your model seems to be working or not. Why? Because this cross-section shows you quite a bit of spread in the average returns. So there is the part of the spread which is related, again, to the size, and we know it is there. And there is the part of the spread which is related to the um, book-to-market ratio, which I know, again, will be there. So explaining the differences, the systematic differences between portfolio, that is the goal of an asset pricing model. Okay, so this I already talked about. Yeah. Oh, is it still kind of, you know, useless to rely on these like one, two or three factor models? Well, the academics is not really very much kind of out of reality here because there was a big survey conducted in 2010 where <clears throat> they asked 201 investment managers and 63 academics. They asked what sort of models, what sort of risk models would you be using? Or what do you expect people to be using? And what they find out is that KPM with either size industry adjustment or from, from, from a French model or related things, they're actually really, really popular empirically. So it's not just we kind of fit regressions and you know, hope for the best but actually there are a lot of people out there who are using it in practical money management, in mutual funds, in hedge funds, and so on and so forth. So how can I summarize 50 years of empirical asset pricing research? We know that under a very small set of assumptions, the main of which being no arbitrage, the law of one price, which seems pretty reasonable if you think about it, that exists an SDF that seems to be priced in asset returns. And all our goals is really trying to understand what is the nature of that stochastic discount factor which represents the relevant risks for the economy. Okay? And the way we do that is because we know that there are different characteristics of different stocks. Some perform better than others. And we can try to explain why some performs better than others through their exposure to the stochastic discount factor. The easiest class of models for that M are the linear factor models, where you can add not only market return, but size, value, liquidity, momentum, short selling constraints, and all sorts of things. And since they are not only easier to use in practice, but also in academic research, they're easy to construct, they're easy to compute, and the data was getting more and more available, and computers were able to compute faster and faster lots of different models and sorts and new data sets and so on and so forth. As you would imagine, now again, we have a zoo of factors. Over the years, there have been accumulated an immense amount of evidence of different factors being important for the cross-section of stock returns. And I would like to emphasize it again, sorry for repeating the same thing, but this is kind of important is that we're not trying to predict returns for next period. We're trying to understand why one stocks have returns higher than the other. Okay, that's the goal here. So at this stage, we have several hundreds different factors that have been advocated in different papers as significant determinant for the cross-section of stocks. And this is why one of the questions that we should be asking now is not just what prices asset returns, but why do we have so many things that seem to be pricing those asset returns? And when I say so many, here's one of the examples. This is a table from a recent paper by Harvey Leonju, who documents over 300 different factors that have been identified and published in top journals and you know, have been cited and used in both practical and academic work, all of which have been claimed to be important determinants for the cross-section of stocks every single one of them. Furthermore, this is actually an understatement 
because they kind of cut out a lot of journals from the sample, they didn't consider a lot of working papers. So the whole universe of significant factors is actually much more. It's probably five or 600. And we also know that five or 600 of cross-sectional factors is definitely too much. Why do we know that? Because a lot of these models, they contain no more than four variables. So pretty much every single paper is just taking one to three standard variables and it's adding another on top. It never adds one more variable to the 500 that have been tried before. It just adds one on top of two or three that are sort of standard. So they have never really been tested kind of against each other. And it's always a fairly low dimensional problem. But if you know that there are 500 models with four variables, with each being able to explain the cross-section of returns, then you definitely understand that 500 is a little bit too much, but there should be less. So why do we have such a proliferation of factors? This is another illustration of what has been going on, especially in the recent years. This is the factor production rate. As you can see, initially, this is where KPM began. It was the first factor model, and it was the first fundamental model of the asset pricing. But especially after discovery of those size and value anomalies, uh, the introduction of the methodology that allows to estimate the cross-sectional impact of their pricing, people have been trying to use all sorts of things in order to find out those important determinants for the cross-sectional stock. And the last 10 years have been just crazy. So if these rates are going to continue with the same speed, we're going to have probably another couple of hundred factors in the next uh, three or four years. This is no good. So the rationale for the current situation that Harvey Leon Zhu offer in that paper is that it is because of the publication bias. I mean, the profession sort of rewards the um, origination and you know, the search for new factors. So once you find something significant, obviously you have much more chances to publish it in a journal compared to saying, yeah, I have tried this one, didn't work, sorry. So that is never getting published. So obviously there is going to be a publication bias related to that. But on top of that, there is going to be also an issue of that multiple testing that I have already talked in the previous lecture. If I have 500 factors, even randomly generated, and let's say one standard cross-section of stock returns, if I just try those 500 factors, there's going to be at least something that is going to be statistically found as significant. And the more factors I try, the higher is going to be the probability that at least something is going to be significant, even if all of it is noise. So in the paper, they also advocate how to try to control for that universe of factors and this random significance that seems to be rising there. Another potential channel that I would like to talk about here is going to be different. Is that, sure, multiple testing is important and publication effect probably is there as well. But maybe there is also something wrong with the methods that we use in order to evaluate whether a particular factor prices the cross-section of stock returns. And here's what I have in mind. So let us recap. A typical linear factor model basically tells you that the excess return on the stock can be decomposed into the product of two things. There is the asset exposure to a particular source of risk, and there is the price impact of that exposure, the price of risk. So in a typical KPM, the standard linear capital pricing model, you know that the excess return on the stock is going to be driven by the beta with respect to the market multiplied by the market as return. In this case, beta is going to be precisely my exposure to risk, right? And this market excess return is going to be something that I'm going to be calling price of risk, okay? So think about it. For every unit of exposure, how high should be my rate of average return? I could have different factors. So with many different factors, I would try to postulate that there could be additional variables here, let's say beta with respect to some other variable multiplied by the price impact of that variable, which is a constant in the cross-section, plus a beta with respect to a third factor multiplied by the price impact of that factor, and so on and so forth. So I could simply write it as basically the product of various betas with four particular list of factors multiplied by lambda. In most cases, there are going to be three or four variables, so it's a low-dimensional problem. How could we try to estimate where being exposed to a particular source of risk, whether my correlation with that time series that I have in mind is really going to be resulting in the price and impact? 
How to check whether that correlation translates to additional returns? How to check whether that correlation is priced? Here's one of the way. We're going to start with the time series first. So I have returns on 25 portfolios. And for example, I have three factors in mind that I would like to test whether they explain the differences between the returns on those 25 portfolios. So first, I need an estimate of beaters. For each of those portfolio, I'm going to run a simple linear regression of the returns on the portfolio on my factors. And I'm going to get beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 for each of those 25 portfolios. So now I have a matrix of betas. The next step is going to be cross-sectional one. Remember the logic behind this cross-sectional asset pricing is that my differences in returns should be explained by my values of beta. If the beta is higher and the price of risk is positive, that means that my rate of return should also be higher. So in the second stage, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just take an average return on each of those 25 portfolios. So I have 25 data points, and I'm going to regress it against my estimates of betas. Essentially, I'm going to be looking at this regression. And the thing that I'm going to be looking for is the slope in this regression. Whether having different betas is going to translate to different average returns associated with a particular portfolio. And if the slope of that regression, this lambda coefficient here, is different from zero, then I'm going to say that yes, indeed, that risk is priced. Why? Because it's not enough to just correlate with something. Stock market correlates with tons of things. The key feature is that if I have two stocks and one correlates more than the other, that means that the return on the first one should be higher than the return on the other. Only then I can say that this is really a source of risk because being exposed to that fluctuation is going to be rewarded with additional returns. That's the definition of the risk. Okay? So these are the so-called Farmer Magbeas cross-sectional regressions. I could also estimate the risk premium with a GMM. It's fine. Um, so what could go wrong? Imagine if I'm going to throw in a factor here that actually doesn't correlate with any of the returns in my cross-section. So the true betas of every single one of those 25 portfolios are actually equal to zero. But I'm not going to see those zeros. Why? Because I estimate those beta in the uh, small sample, right? So there's still going to be some sort of fluctuations. But what does that mean for the second stage, for this cross-sectional regression? That means that when I estimate the risk premium, I'm essentially going to be regressing against a vector of 25 numbers that asymptotically become zero. If I had a really long sample of data, I would be basically just regressing against zeros. So obviously, if I do something like this, then the premium, the slope in front of that zero regressor is going to be really, really huge. It's going to be exploding. Why? Because I'm dividing by zero. That's essentially what I'm doing here. Either I'm going to be just dividing by zero, or I'm going to be inverting the matrix that is going to have reduced rank. Again, why? Because one of the regressors asymptotically becomes just a column of zero. So it turns out that this simple idea is actually very prevalent empirically. And that is what I'm going to talk for the next about 20 minutes or so. Let me show you an illustrative experiment of how large could be this impact. I'm going to take, again, the standard cross-section of 25 portfolios from the French quarterly returns. And I'm going to take the three of those factors that are used in practice. These are going to be uh, from a French three factors, the market, HML, and SMB. And on top of that, I'm going to generate a normally distributed random variable, just 0, 1. I could also take something with a mean and variance of, let's say, consumption growth or some other kind of time series that you have in mind. It doesn't really matter. And every time I generate a new time series of this normally distributed random variable, which is noise, right? It's totally independent from everything else. It's not related to returns. It's not related to factors. It's just randomly generated time series. Every time I generate a new time series, I'm going to estimate a four-factor model on that cross-section of 25 portfolios. So I'm going to check whether market is priced. I'm going to check whether size, whether value is priced. And I'm going to check whether that fourth magical factor is going to be cross-sectionally priced as well. And again, recall, it has nothing to do with anything at all. None of the real data. 
So if you repeat the experiment many, many times and you use conventional statistics in order to assess its significance, you will find out that regardless of how careful you are with the standard, you know, standard areas and everything else, that factor, which was just generated in a computer, is going to be found as priced in the cross-section of stock returns in about half of the simulations. Okay? So again, something that is totally orthogonal to both returns and factors is going to be a significant determinant for the cross-section of stock returns in roughly half of the cases. One thing that I would like to highlight is that for those of you who are familiar with the financial models, um, Fama Macbeth's regressions is criticized for many reasons. One of them being that when you do the second stage, you regress against the estimates of betas, not the true values. And this additionally introduces sort of an error into your estimation that you need to take into account and so on and so forth. You can deal with other techniques. You can deal with GMM, you can correct those standard errors. All of them are going to have exactly the same problem. Every single one under the standard inference, if you don't notice that you have this issue of dividing by zero accidentally, um, they're all going to indicate that your factor is being priced, while it obviously isn't. Okay, just to have you an idea of why GMM is going to fail here as well, well, the idea is simple. If you set up a system of moments that is gonna be, again, pricing that cross-section of 25 portfolios, if there is a factor which is spurious, which is useless, which does not correlate with any of those portfolios in the example, so in principle, then you will find out that the matrix of the first derivatives is going to have reduced rank. It's the same as doing an OLS on a bunch of regressors when they have reduced rank. gauss marker theorem doesn't work. The properties of the estimator, asymptotic distribution, everything else, are going to be very different compared to the standard ones. And that's exactly what happens with the GMM as well. So GMM is not going to save you. So instead of talking about asymptotics and presenting that non-standard asympt asymptotic um, results that have been found for this particular setting, I'm going to talk intuitively of what happens when you have this issue. Okay? So if you throw in this factor that does not correlate with any of the assets, but you still proceed with estimating all this cross-sectional impact and so on and so forth, there are going to be uh, two different types of effects depending on whether your initial model is correctly specified or misspecified. Now, by correct specification, I mean the case where all the cross-sectional differences between stocks, portfolios, are fully explained by their exposure to those risk factors that you have in mind. For instance, three factors or four factors. So once you get those betas right, there are no cross-sectional differences. Okay? That's going to be the right model. So what has been shown in the prior literature is that, first of all, even for the correct, for correct factors, for the true ones, the risk premium are going to be consistent if you use standard estimation techniques, but it's going to be no longer kind of symptotically normal, okay? So the T-stats are going to be wrong. The risk premium for that spurious factor, you're going to find out, it's not going to converge to any constant, regardless of the sample size it's going to basically just keep fluctuating as a random variable. So even if you have one million of observations, you're still gonna see quite a lot of variation in the estimation of the risk premium. It is not consistent in the standard definition. Various measures of fit that you may use in order to assess the quality of those models, such as related to the R-squared or the so-called hansen jaganathan distance, which also measures the quality of the asset pricing model, they're all going to be inflated. And they're all also gonna have a non-standard property. So actually, adding that spurious factor is going to help you explain the cross-section of stock returns. It would seem that it's, you know, really important one. The T-stats are high, the risk premium is reasonable, the R-square is good, but it could be still spurious. Now, if you believe that this linear factor model is just an approximation to reality, and the actual data generating process is not really linear factor model, and after all, I mean, this is what we have in mind, then you are in the case of the misspecified model. The misspecified, the easiest way to think about it, is that even after controlling for all those differences in betas, there are still going to be residual differences in the returns of your portfolios. This is what I have here is lambda i naught. Okay? So what is going to happen if I'm going to add a spurious factor into this setting? First of all, the estimates for the risk premia, even for the good factors, become inconsistent here. You're going to be biased. The asymptotic distribution, again, is going to be different. It's going to be shifted. 
The worst thing is that the risk premia associated with these spurious factors, the bad guys, it doesn't just you know, keep fluctuating as a random variable. It actually tends to explode to the point that asymptotically the T statistic associated with the spurious factors tends to infinity. Okay? So the more data you're going to have, the more evidence you will see in favor of that factor being actually priced, which is counterintuitive, but this is what unfortunately happens. Of course, in finite sample, you're never going to see t stats equal to 1,000 or 500 or something else. You're going to see very reasonable numbers, like 2, 3, 4, and you would say, that looks really good. That seems like a good factor. But again, this is just a consequence for the identification failure and for the failure of the standard asymptotic theory to work in this particular case. And again, all the conventional measures of fit, such as R squared, hansen jack and and distance, everything is invalid. In short, once you lose identification, and in this case, it basically relates to the rank of your regressors, okay, you lose everything. So what can you do? Um, one of the ways to deal with this problem that I suggest in the paper is to adapt the literature from the lasso in order to select those factors which are identified. And here's the trick. So in the usual cross-sectional stage that you would estimate there, trying to explain those differences in returns of different securities, usually you would start by regressing your 25 average returns against the matrix of the betas, right? But on top of that, I'm going to add a penalty function. A penalty function that is going to be inversely proportional to how much my portfolios are correlated with that function. And here's the idea. Imagine that I have this spurious factor, okay? So I know that all the betas, or let's say partial correlations or related quantities, are going to be fairly close to zero, if the true value is zero. How close? They're gonna converge there at the rate of one over t. This is our standard time series asymptotics. So I know that every single one of those betas is gonna be of the order one over t, okay? So if I take, for example, the sum of those absolute betas, I'm also going to get something that converges to zero at the rate of routine. Now, what can I do with my penalty? I'm just gonna define a penalty that is inversely proportional to that sum of those absolute values. So if I have a spurious factor in the sense that there is not a single asset in my cross section which correlates enough with that asset, I'm gonna have a penalty that explodes, that becomes really, really high, and that is gonna really penalize the existence of this variable in the model. And if the penalty is gonna be really, really high and it doesn't really help anything in terms of explaining the cross-section of returns, but the properties of kind of lasso-related things, the risk premium associated with the spurious factor is gonna be set exactly to zero. Not just asymptotically, but in finite sample as well, again, by the properties of the lasso. At the same time, if I have a true factor, a factor that is important for at least the time series dimension, then I know that there is going to be at least one portfolio with which is going to correlate enough. What does that mean? That means that if I'm going to take the sum of the absolute values of those correlations, I know that there is going to be at least one number that does not converge to zero. That means that the whole sum also is not going to converge to zero. So if I divide by it, I'm not going to get something that explodes. And it's precisely this behavior between the rates of convergence and where exactly they go, depending whether I have at least one portfolio for which my factor is going to be good this allows me to differentiate the price and impact of the spurious factors and the good ones. As a result, the spurious factors are going to be penalized really, really harshly, and they're basically going to be eliminated, kicked out from the model. At the same time, the good factors are going to be estimated, the penalty is designed in such a way that they're going to be estimated without any bias. Basically, it's the so-called oracle property of the lasso as if you knew in advance that this was the, sub of, the subset of variables that you should have focused in the first place. It's gonna have exactly the same distribution, okay? One thing that I would like to highlight when talking about this potential solution is that it is different from the standard lasso. In fact, the standard lasso or adaptive lasso, which also looks kind of familiar here, they're not going to work in this setting. And intuitively, why? Well, look at adaptive lasso, for example. Adaptive lasso is going to do the following. Imagine that I have already estimated the price of risk associated with the particular risk factors. Then I'm going to do this penalized regression where I'm going to assign a weight 
which is going to be inversely proportional to my prior estimate of the risk premium. So normally that is the following. If I have a bunch of regressors, okay, and I estimated the impact, their coefficients, if that coefficient is going to be small, I actually don't want to have that regressor in the model. So that's why adaptive loss or penalty here is going to be fairly large. And it's going to be penalized, and once you do this thing, it's going to be limited from the model. At the same time, if I have a variable which is important, that means that the risk premium associated with that variable should be large. And then the penalty from the adaptive loss should be small, and it should be retained in the model. This doesn't work here. Why? Because if your prior estimates, let's say with OLS, those thumb and less regressions, they were, if there was a spurious factor, that means that your prior estimates are biased. In particular, the risk premium associated with a spurious factor as a result is not going to be penalized enough because it will seem that it's big, it's significant. And the risk premium associated with a proper factor is actually going to be penalized too harshly. So adaptive loss in this case is going to be selecting wrong factors. That's going to be true for Lasso and to, to the best of my knowledge for all the other penalties. Because here the problem is not choosing something which is significant or not. Here the problem is choosing something that can be identified from the data. And that is a different. Okay. Another illustration that this is very different from adaptive Lasso. I just explained that the weights for the penalty that you're going to be using in adaptive Lasso, if you were to apply it in this context, are going to be penalizing those factors in the wrong direction. That's exactly what the table says. So the adaptive loss, so is going to retain spurious factors. It's going to eliminate the two ones. Okay. <coughs> I wanted to show you some empirical applications. There are lots of different examples. And obviously, I cannot show you all of them, especially since we have like 500 different factors. <coughs> so I'm going to show you some of the cases where nothing changes, where things change a lot, and where things change partially. So first of all, let's start with the basic models. So let's say KPM and Pharma French, there's also the thing that's like quality minus junk, which is the factor which is based on the quality of the firm, based on various characteristics. <coughs> In short, nothing changes. Whether I use the standard procedure, whether I use the procedure which tries to do all this identification problem, the results are exactly the same. Okay, risk premium are the same, R square is the same, everything is the same. Here's an example where some of the factors that are used are non-tradable and they're related to consumption, particularly durable and non-durable consumption goods. Things change a lot because both of those factors that used to be really significant determinant for the cross-section of stocks, they're all going to disappear. In short, there is simply not enough movement between asset returns and consumption growth in order to reliably estimate whether that movement can be translated into the risk premium. Um, you can try in any way you want with lots of different models. The results are going to be basically the same. Here's the case with some of the uh, four-factor models, where in addition to the size and the market, I also have what is related to investment and the profitability factor. This is a very popular model because it manages to explain a lot of the cross-sectional anomalies in asset returns. And depending on the cross-section that I will look at, so depending on the, you know, the cross-section and returns that I try to explain. What I see is that some of those factors, they're going to be important, but others are going to be spurious. But if you put all four into the model, you're going to miss out the true pricing exposure, the true pricing impact of the particular variables. Okay? What does that mean? That means that if I have a spurious factor, not only it's going to appear to be significant, but it's also going to take away the explanatory power from the variable, which actually is important, but you're going to miss out because it's going to be simply crowded out from the model by those spurious guys. Okay? So that is an example where this happens. Okay. <clears throat> so in short, um, if you deal with models that involve some sort of estimation, um, another object that you should always also try to check is whether the model parameters that you are trying to estimate were actually identified. Because only if they are identified then the properties of the estimation procedures are going to be well behaved. That is, you can trust your usual t statistics, your r squared, and so on and so forth. And this is one particular example where the violation of this condition led to drastically different conclusions. I suspect that about 60% of the cross sectional factors are going to be contaminated by this problem alone. Okay. <clears throat> 
So one of the questions that came during the break is about PCA. What about implied factors? Because all the variables that I have listed so far, there was sort of, you know, fundamental characteristic base. So they're sort of like economic variables, like accounting variables, macroeconomic variables, and so on and so forth. But there are lots of research um, that allows to extract factors directly from the data, principal components being one of them. So why not try to use it here? After all, we know that the cross-sectional returns should be fully explained through the exposure on essentially what is one factor, the SDL. So why not just take it out directly from the observed returns? The problem is that all those factor sort of models with implicit factors, they're gonna be focusing on the time series dimension alone. They just try to explain basically the time series variation, the joint, the average time series variation for each of those stocks that are gonna be forming my cross section. The stochastic discount factor and the fundamental equation for the asset pricing that I gave you, it said nothing about residual cross correlations, okay? I don't want to explain why stocks correlate with each other. To be honest, the model that we have in mind here, it has no implication in it whatsoever. The only thing it does says is that there is a certain common risk between the two, okay? That commonality is gonna be caused by the loadings on the SDF. And those loadings on the SDF, they should be translated to the average returns. To give you an example, a lot of those economically motivated factors, they do not really explain 90% of the time series variation of returns. They can be explaining 30% of the time series variation on returns on average. They could be explaining 40% of that time series variation. But they're gonna be explaining 80% of the differences between average returns. Portfolio one, portfolio two, portfolio 25, okay? So it is the time series versus cross-sectional dimension. And they're gonna be significant. So those price of risk, they're gonna be really, really explaining why Apple is different from Microsoft. The implied factors that people have been trying to use so far with principal components, independent component analysis, and a bunch of other techniques, they're very successful at explaining, on average, the time series variation in those returns. They get 80%, they get 90%, they do a great job at doing that. But then they try to test whether loading on those factors that are extracted from the data can explain the differences between the returns on Apple and Microsoft, and they find out that they can't. So essentially, there are two dimensions in the asset pricing. There is the time series and there is the cross-sectional. The empirical asset pricing literature is focusing more or less fully on the cross-sectional dimension. Unfortunately, implied factor models based on principal components, they do not manage to explain this cross-sectional dimension. They're simply not designed to do it because there is nothing in the extraction of the PCA that tells you that loadings on the PCA should lead to different expected returns. It's just a different goal, a different tool. Okay, why not use individual stocks? Why do we still bother with portfolios? You know, after all, we have large computers, we can compute lots of different things. Well, historically, again, it was due to various computational techniques. Um, nowadays, things are much better, so why not just switch? One of the explanations consists in the fact that individual stocks are contaminated with a lot of idiosyncratic noise. That means that reliably estimating what is their impact, what is their reaction to various factors, and whether you can translate differences in those estimates of betas to the price of risk is gonna come with very low, very low signal to noise ratio. So simply speaking, it, it won't be informative enough. There will be too much noise around. What portfolio does, portfolio forming approach, it basically allows you to like couple and to group similar stocks together, okay? so that the idiosyncratic noise washes out, at least to some extent, and you're really focusing on the systematic part of the returns, something which is similar to all the stocks in the same category, okay? That said, um, there is uh, like a lot of recent research, especially the last uh, three or four years, that try to develop various portfolio-based asset pricing and cross-sectional asset pricing models using individual stocks. So this is the case where asymptotics becomes not only when t goes to infinity, but when n goes to infinity as well, because there is a huge number of stocks, and there is lots of time series observation for each of them. You can also relax a lot of the assumptions that I have been using so far. For instance, you can think that beta is time varying, fine. You could think that the risk premium is also time varying, I'm constant, fine. 
All of this can be done, for example, with the approach of Galliardini's Cayono soloids, forthcoming in Econometrica. It's a fantastic paper. It works on individual stocks. The obvious problem, again, is signal-to-noise ratio. You can allow for all of these things, but it's going to be hard to estimate them reliably. Okay, so the last uh, couple of minutes, I would like to really talk a little bit about kind of Lucas critique. And it is extremely important to do all the econometrics right. But once all the econometrics is, you know, done and sort of discussed and published and written and everything, it is also important to understand what it means. And in economics, we deal not with atoms or laws or something, we deal with people. So quite often, interpreting the results of the regression is going to depend, depending on their behavior and what it actually means. So I'm going to give you two examples where this is going to be really substantial. Example number one is from the mutual fund managers. So we have a lot of data on what are their positions, how they behave, and so on and so forth. And there is, have been a huge debate in the literature on whether those managers actually have skill or not, you know, whether they can kind of outperform naive investors or not. And the usual argument against that skill that a monkey can do as well by just throwing darts is that if a manager is really skillful, that means that if he has a high return this year, it probably means that he should also have a high return next year. Okay. But by looking at the time series of returns of different managers, you see that there is no persistence. So many people concluded that since there is no other correlation, that means there is no skill. This is not true. Here is why. Think of the general equilibrium outcome. If I'm a good manager, and today um, I was managing a portfolio of $10 million, and I have a strategy, a way to generate a pure profit, let's say, condition, like apart from all the risks and everything else, I have a way to generate a pure profit of $1 million. That means that my additional rate of return is 10%. That's cool. That's awesome. But people are smart, and they see the return of different managers. So next year, are they going to bring the money to me? And next year, I'm going to have a portfolio of $20 million to manage. But most of the strategies, most of the returns, most of the economics, you cannot easily scale it up. On average, they're actually going to stay the same, or there's going to be decreasing returns to scale. If you manage too much money, and when you buy or sell like a huge bulk of stuff, you're just going to move the market in the opposite direction from you. Therefore, quite often, the same managers are going to, again, generate a profit of, for example, $1 million. But now, it's going to be $1 million on a portfolio of 20. Okay? So now my rate of return is only 5%. So what it means is that as the manager is really successful, basically he has to deal with a lot more money. And that's why once you condition for the size of the fund that he's managing, his return is going to get lower, lower, and lower. So in the equilibrium, when all this is being equalized, you're going to see both talented and non-talented people displaying the same rates of return, despite the fact that they could be generating very different value added to the investors. And once you look at the value added to an investor, you understand that there is a lot of skill at the moment. And the last little bit is about the publication and its impact on the research. What happens to the trading strategies, to those factors, after they have been discovered? It turns out that after their publication, the return to the strategy typically decreases by 50%. And this is attributed to both the in-sample versus out-of-sample, and the impact of maybe some of the people are arbitrageurs that just trade away those extra profits from the market once they know that there is new arbitrage opportunity. There is a recent paper that tried to test this hypothesis. They looked at the following. Institutional investors now manage 60% of the equity in the US. So they're like really, really large participants. And we know their positions because they have to disclose them every quarter. So let us check whether they try to load more on those anomalies, on those strategies that are getting published that is buying the correct stocks and selling the correct stocks once the anomaly becomes publicly available. And they find that this is indeed the case. Once the anomaly or the factor or something else is getting published, um, institutional investors like hedge funds and things like that, they start buying those stocks that you were supposed to be buying following the anomaly. And they start selling those stocks that you were supposed to be selling following the anomaly. If you think that the turnover is like 0.75% is small, it's not because we're really talking about something like eight and a half billion dollars of change in ownership. Okay, so economically this effect is massive. And this leads down to both, this is precisely the accumulative trading, long short position, and the changes in the returns. Returns go down. The key question is, why don't they disappear? 
50% goes away, but 50% stays. That means that they cannot trade away, which implies, once again, that it's not about free lunch. A lot of it is about risk. There should be some sort of risk that precludes you from just taking advantage of this new publication uh, thing. Okay, so that's about it for today. So the talk was about a surprising, both time series and kind of cross-sectional predictability. There are lots of different models, lots of different data, and we can learn a lot using new techniques, using new methods, and using new data sets. So there's obviously a lot to learn and a lot to understand. But apart from doing the econometrics right, which is super important, we should also be thinking of what it means. What do those parameters, what do those patterns in the data imply for our understanding of the world? Thank you very much. drops down by like something like 50%, but it doesn't disappear. Yes. Uh, so isn't it the case that if everybody uh, tries to trade with that strategy, then you should, well, then the strategy shouldn't uh, work anymore? That is correct, but the thing is, how to think about strategy and how to think about those profits. If those profits are the reward for risk, which is associated with holding them, then they should not disappear. It's the same as beta. There is a return on the stock which is high, but that should be explained by its exposure to risk. With those particular strategies that the authors were considering, what they find out is that the short leg, sort of the returns which is associated with shorting particular stocks, those persist. Why? Because actually one of the things that is not taken into account by the majority of this reduced form model are the costs of maintaining a short position, the so-called short interest. Yeah. A lot of those stocks, they're just very expensive to short. Once you take that into account, it disappears. Uh, something else, uh, just I'm kind of interested uh, about applying these kind of things in the Iranian market. Uh, you know there is no short selling here uh, in the stock market. Uh, so do you think that if there is some strategy here uh, and it's revealed, then it will uh, not work anymore here? Uh, maybe, maybe. Again, um, Strategy is not just a way to generate return. Strategy is also a way to expose yourself to risk. Depending on the market structure, these risks can be very different. In particular, when there is a market with a n no short uh, sale, of course, first, the strategies itself are going to be different, but at the same time, the risks associated with them are also going to be different. I don't know whether it's a free lunch or whether it's possible to get some arbitrage out of it. It might, if you're smart enough, um, but generally, there are a lot, a lot of really smart people trading on the market. So it's very complicated. And a lot of the risks that you're exposing yourself while doing it, you do not understand it yet. Yeah. This, for example, happened to the LTCM, the famous fund that was funded by Nobel Prize winners in economics, and that spectacularly went bust in 1997. Yeah. And then everybody was laughing that, you know, Nobel Prize in economics, if they cannot manage their own money, then obviously who can? But what we saw afterwards is that they were exposed precisely to the sort of risks that were not captured by traditional models. And unfortunately, it was enough to bankrupt them completely. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Yeah. So I think we can stop here. Thank you, Espita, for the Thank lecture. You. And uh, I have a comment about the question that Omid asked. Uh, we don't have short sell in Iran, but uh, we have futures on uh, e uh, stock in the stock market. <laughs> yeah, it's but it's uh, you know growing. So probably in near future we can use futures on uh, stocks sure. as a short sell. Yeah, I hope you all enjoyed the first day of uh, the Big Data Economic Summer School. We will see you tomorrow at 8.30. Uh, we will have two uh, interesting uh, lectures about big data, and uh, uh, it's mainly about econometric models in big data. Thank you.